Hi, my name is Matt Hatel Masri. Today I'm going to present to you a new technology called gRPC that is available with .NET Core 3.0. I'm going to talk to you about how to produce and consume a .NET Core 3.0 gRPC service that talks to Entity Framework. You might ask, what is gRPC? Well, gRPC is yet another web communication technology like Corba, Windows Communications Foundation, .NET Remoting, SOAP, and so on. It relies on a known configuration shared between clients and server. Contracts are called protocol buffers. It communicates with a binary stream more efficient than service that uses JSON or XML. And the server app is very similar to Web API. Now the proto files define the contract between the server and the client. So let's get started. To start with, we need to use .NET Core 3.0. So I'm going to go into command prompt here and let's see what version of .NET I have. As you can see, I'm using .NET Core 3.0. So that allows me to do a bit of gRPC. So I'm going to be using Visual Studio 2019. So I'll start by clicking on this create a new project. I'll filter on gRPC and you can see here that there is a gRPC template. That's the one I'll be using. The name of my gRPC service is just going to be called gRPC service. My solution name, I'm going to call that something different, gRPC world. Now I'm purposely distinguishing between the project name and the solution name because later on I'm going to add a client for the service and it would come under the same solution. So let's click on create. Now once again we see that it is confirming to us that we're going to be using the gRPC service and I'll leave everything else as default. Let's have a peek at what it created for us. If you expand the Protos folder, you will see that there is a file called the greet.proto. This represents the contract between the server and the client. And if we expand services, you will see here that there is a default service called the greeter service. And this is the actual business logic of what the service does. Let's have a look at the greet.proto file. This is like the version of Proto that's being used, it's Proto 3, and we have a namespace. And there is one service only, and it's called the greeter service, and it's got a method called say hello, it takes a hello request argument, and it returns a hello reply and if you look at what the hello request looks like it takes only one property that property is simply name so this object represents something like a class and the first property in there is name the hello reply is very similar it's got one property and that property is simply message now if it had a second property you'd sort of put that in here for example, it would, if there was another property, say type, it would take on number two. So this number is nothing but a sequence of the various properties. Let's look at the service. Now, what does the service do? This is a simple class that inherits from the greeter, greeter base. You might ask, where is greeter? So let's click on this and go to the definition. And you will see that there is a class that was created behind the scenes that pretty much mimics the proto file. Now this is something done by Visual Studio and you don't need to create it. If you look at the service class, it inherits from this greeter, greeter base. And this is auto created for us. This is the constructor. The constructor uses iLogger and this is basically dependency injection. 
but you might wonder where is this iLogger being used? It's not being used in this class, but you can use it for logging certain activities in your application. Here is the say hello method that was described in our proto file. You can see here that we have one method and this is the implementation of that method. It takes a hello request and a server call context object as arguments. And what this does, it returns a hello reply. And in this case, it's going to just simply say hello and it's going to add the name coming from the request. So this is our request object and the request object has a property called name, just like we defined it here because the hello request object basically is this hello request object and it's got a property called name. Notice that when we define the, the contract, name here is in lowercase, but over here, name is in uppercase. And this is simply so that the conventions that are being used by C Sharp are respected. Most properties in C Sharp are uppercase. Let's run this application and see what happens. So if I do control F5 to run the application, it's going to start a server. And over here, you can see that the server has started listening on port 5001. So let's go to this location and see what it looks like. So I'm going to open up my browser and go to localhost 5001 and see what happens. And basically you get a message here saying communication with gRPC endpoints must be made through a gRPC client to learn how to create a client visit so and so. So bottom line is there's nothing to see. If you want to know what the service does, you need to consume it from a client application. Therefore, we shall now create a client application. So let's create another project. I'm going to close this app and let's add another project to our solution. So I'm going to go add new project and this time I'll simply create a console application. So I'm going to choose this and click on next. And for this, I'm just going to call it gRPC client. And go create. To consume that service, we need to add some packages into our client application. So let's do that. I'm going to take all of these. These are the three packages that we need. Google.protobuf, grpc.net.client, and grpc tools. So I'm going to copy all of these and go into a command prompt on the client side and paste these. To add the packages. The next thing is we're going to copy this protos file onto the client application. So on the client application I'm going to add a new folder and I'll just call it protos like on the server and copy over this greet.proto file and put it on the client. So now on the client I basically took the greet.proto from the server and made a copy of it on the client side. In the csproj file on the client side, we need to make a small edit. So I'm going to come here and edit the project file on the client side. And when you do that, because we copied over this file, onto the client side, you can see this XML line. Now we will change this simply to client. And it's very, very important that once you do this, you save and you rebuild the client. Otherwise the next step won't work. So I'm going to go over here and rebuild the client. Now, when you rebuild the client, it creates the proxy classes on the client side. Let's go into the program.cs file and change our main method so that we can consume the service in the main method. So I've changed my main method with this code. Let me resolve these namespaces here. 
Now you will see that my hello request object, it gets resolved on the client side because the proxies got created for me when I built and this also gets resolved. So now if you look at what we're doing here, I'm instantiating a hello request and the property is Jane Bond. I'm opening a channel pointing to this address and with that channel object, I'm going to use it to call the greeter, greeter client method. Now this greeter class was created as a proxy and it always would create another method in there called the name of the service client. So you pass channel to greeter client method and it returns a client object. With that client object, you can call the method on the server side. And this is always called asynchronously. So we call the method on the server side and we pass it the hello request object and it returns a reply object. From the reply, you can get the message. Let's go back to our greet proto file and you will see that the input is a name and the output is a message, which is pretty much what we have here. The name is being passed in the hello request object and the output is coming from the reply object and a, the message is a property that belongs to that object. So we're going to display the output. We have to remember that in order for us to test this, we need to first start the server application, which is the service. And secondly, we need to run our command line application. So we're going to come at the solution level here and choose properties. So at the solution level, you want to right click at the solution level and choose properties. On this screen, you should select multiple startup projects. And we've got these projects, but the server has to start first. So the gRPC service has to start first and the client has to start second. So we have to do a bit of reordering here. So we're going to click on gRPC service and promote that to being at the top. And we'll choose start for both of these. This became the first project to run and this became the second project to run. And both of them are set to start. So now let's apply this, click on OK and run our application and see what happens. And there we go. That was pretty fast. We got our output, which is hello, Jane Bond. Jane Bond is the name that we passed to the service and the service just replied by saying hello, Jane Bond. Now let's create an entity framework model and eventually we're going to create a database and try to integrate the database with our service so that our service can read some data from a database and send that out to the client. The model that we're going to create is a student model and it just has an integer student ID string first name, string last name, and string school. Let's copy all of this and create a student model in our application. So I'm going to create two folders on my server side. One is for models. So I'm going to create a models folder here. And also I'll create a data folder on my server side. So these are the two folders that I created. The data folder and the models folder. In the models folder, I'm going to add a student class. And the code for the student class is what I just showed you a minute ago, which is this. Let's close. There are some packages that I need to add in order to talk to SQL Server. I need these four packages that have to do with Entity Framework and I need the gRPC tools 
package which helps me for tooling and I will tell you later on why that's important. So this is to be installed on the server side. So I'm going to go into my server application. and execute these statements in the command line so that I can get these packages. The next thing is I need to create a database context because I want to use Entity Framework to talk to a local DB SQL Server database. So I shall come to the data folder here and add a new class which I will call school db context. And the code for school db context will be a class that inherits from db context. I'm also going to take advantage of this class in order to seed some data in the database. So this is my school db context. It inherits from DB context. So let me resolve these namespaces here. My student class. If you look at this school DB context, it inherits from DB context. This is the constructor. The constructor simply passes the options to the base class. And the on model creating method, it is method that's responsible for seeding some sample data. You can see down here that I have a method called getStudents and this getStudents method it seeds one, two, three, four, five students. Each student has an ID, a first name, a last name and a school. Now this line is important because it tells the context class that in the database we want to have a table called students and it's a DB set of the student model. This is where the data is being seeded by calling this getStudents method and this getStudents method it returns a list of students and that gets populated in the database. So now we have our DB context class. The next thing is Inside of the startup.cs, we want to associate the DB context class with a database. But before we do that, we want to add a connection string in our app settings file here. Now we're going to talk simply to the local DB database. So I've got here a connection string that allows us to talk to local DB. And as you can see here, this is a standard connection string. I've called my database simply school. Now that I have my connection string, I can add some code in startup.cs. Because I need to read the connection string, I need a configuration object in my startup.cs. If you look at what we have here, we have a very simple startup.cs file and it doesn't really have any configuration object. So what I'll do is Using dependency injection, I'm going to create a constructor here. I will make available to the class this I configuration object, which will allow me to read the connection string from app.settings. Now that I have my constructor, I'm going to go inside of my configure services method and add some code to associate the connection string with my DB context class. And that will go right in the configure services method. And I'm resolving the namespaces. Let's rebuild the server. Now that the server has been rebuilt and we have all the hooks in place for our database and entity framework, we can apply some migrations. So I'm going to execute a few commands in the terminal window. The first one is this command dotnet ef migrations add m1 this is the name of the migration and the output will go into a directory called data migrations. 
and the command.net ef database update will actually create the artifacts in the database. So let's start with this command here. Let's copy this, paste it here. Now at this point, if we go into our application under data migrations, you will see this file here. And this file is called the Fluid API. And basically it has the commands for creating the tables and seeding the data, as you can see here. There are two methods. One is called up and one is down. This actually creates the artifacts. This rolls back the artifacts. So we are now able to execute the next command to actually create the database. Let's do that now. You can see from these statements that the database has been created and that data has been seeded. Let's just make sure that we can see the data. In Visual Studio, I'm going to go to View, SQL Server, Object Explorer. And this will allow me to see the databases. So what I'll do is I'll expand databases and under databases, I should be able to see that database. So let's try. And there we go. We've got the school database and under there we have the students table. This other table is used by Entity Framework for making sure that the model in your application hasn't changed. But we're going to concern ourselves with the students table. So let's just open it up and see that we have some data and sure enough this is the data that we were seeding so we're good now that our database is working let us add a student's protofile that represents the service that we're going to be creating on the server side so i'm going to go to the server side and under the protos folder i shall create a new protofile so i'm going to add new item and in the filter, if I enter proto, it will filter for me this item, proto buffer file. And this one, I'm going to call it students proto, as you can see here. Let's click on add. Now, it does give us the first two lines of this file. For the remaining, I've got some code for that. We're going to create a service called remote student and I purposely put the name remote before students so that we don't have any confusion with the student class that comes from entity framework. Now this is the only method that there is get student info. It takes a student lookup model, which is this message here. And this message only has one property student ID and it returns student model. This is the student model over here, and it's got four properties that are mapped to the properties of the student class that we created before. Now we need to click on the student's proto file, and in the properties, we're going to change this build action. So come over to build action, and you'll find protobuf compiler. If you did not install the grpc.tools package, you will not see that. After doing that, we need to do another change and that is under grpc subclasses, we want to make that server only, right there. Now that we've done these changes, we need to build the server app. So I'm going to right click on this and rebuild. The next thing is let's add the actual business logic for our student service. I'm going to come to the services folder here and add a class. And this one I'm going to call it students service. So this is what we have here, the students service class. Click on add. The code for the student service will be very similar to the code for the greeter service, except that we're going to get some data from a database. So this is the code. Let me just resolve these namespaces. And we do find the remote student because we rebuilt and the contents of the proto file became available to the environment here. So we can resolve all of these objects and everything seems to be good. Here we have two instance variables 
one for logger, one for the database context. The constructor takes a logger and database context object and it assigns the values to the instance variable. Here we have this one method that takes a request object and a context object and it returns the student model object. Now, this student model object is being instantiated here. I'm going to make a request to the database to find for me the student with a specific student ID and it returns a student object. If it finds, it will not be null. Over here, we're just doing some logging for debugging purposes. Now, if the student object that we turned from our request to the database is not null, then we found indeed the student object. Now, this student object, its properties, we're going to assign them to the properties of this output object, which is student model. And then we're going to return this student model object. So this is what the service does. Once we have set up the service, there's a place in startup.cs where we need to declare this service so that it becomes available to the endpoint. So we're going to pretty much copy this and come over here and replace this with students service. Let's resolve this. Now that we've done our server side service, we want to be able to consume this on the client side. To consume it on the client side, first of all, let us build our server app again because we made a change. And then we should take the student's profile and make a copy of it on our client side application. So I'm going to right click on here, copy and come over here under Protos and paste. So now I have on the client side two proto files, the greet and the student's proto. When we put it on the client side, let's go and look at the csproj file and we'll find that on the csproj file on the client side, we have an entry here for students.proto but this should read client. So I'm going to change it to client. At this point, we can rebuild our entire application. So I'm going to come under Build and Rebuild Solution. I'll choose this so that both my server-side and client-side applications are rebuilt. The next step is let us create some code on the client-side in order to consume our student's service. So I'm going to go to the client side and open up the program.cs file. This was my previous code. I'm going to comment this stuff here and add some code that actually consumes the student service. And this is the code that consumes the student service. Let's see if we can resolve these objects. And sure enough, we can resolve them because a proxy has been created for us. We're going to open a channel to this endpoint, localhost 5001, which is where the service is found. With this channel object, we're going to call the remote student client method that belongs to remote student. This returns for us a student client object. Here we instantiate a student lookup model, which is really our input into the service with property student ID set to 33. Then with the student client object, we're going to call a method called get student info async, which really calls our method on the server. And we'll pass it the input, which is the student input. This returns a student reply object. The student reply object contains the output. It would contain the first name and the last name of our student. Now we're looking for student with ID 33. Let's find out which student has ID 33. We can see here that student with ID 33 is Sue Cox. So if we run this application, we expect the output to be Sue Cox. Let's run it and see. And there we go. Success, we got Sue Cox coming from our student service on the back end, which read this data from a database. Thank you for watching my video and coming this far. I hope to see you in future videos. Goodbye.